Our first scripture reading, reading today is as it has been for the past several weeks, coming to us from the 12th chapter of the Gospel of Mark, beginning with verse 28. I invite you once again to listen for the Word of God. One of the scribes came near and heard them disputing with one another, and seeing that Jesus answered them well, he asked him, which commandment is the first of all? Jesus answered, the first is here, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. And our second reading comes to us from Proverbs chapter 2, verses 1 through 15. Again, I invite you to listen for the word of God. My child, if you accept my words and treasure up my commandments within you, making your ear attentive to wisdom and inclining your heart to understanding, if you indeed cry out for insight and raise your voice for understanding, if you seek it like silver and search for it as for hidden treasures, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom from his mouth. From his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. He stores up sound wisdom for the upright. He is a shield to those who walk blamelessly, guarding the paths of justice and preserving the way of his faithful ones. Then you will understand righteousness and justice and equity, every good path, for wisdom will come into your heart and knowledge will be pleasant to your soul. Prudence will watch over you and understanding will guard you. It will save you from the way of evil, from those who speak perversely, who forsake the paths of uprightness to walk in the ways of darkness, who rejoice in doing evil and delight in the perverseness of evil. Those whose paths are crooked and who are devious in their ways. This is the word of the Lord. Be to God. So you're at the grocery store and you're in a hurry. You've only got two things. You had to swing by and pick them up and you've got to get home as quickly as possible. You're at Harps, so there's only two lanes open. And you have to choose which one is going to be the fastest for you to get through with your two small purchases. You stand, you size them up, you take into account the people that are in each lane, you look at the amount of stuff in their carts, you assess the checkers to see if one seems more awake than the other, and then you make your choice. Two paths presented to you, you do the best you can, and you choose one. Always the wrong one, right? <laughs> You choose one. We do it all throughout our lives. Two paths are presented to us, and we choose one. We choose to accept the job or not accept the job, to undergo the medical treatment or not undergo the medical treatment, to say yes to the proposal or say no to the proposal. Over and over and over again in our lives, paths present themselves to us, and we choose one based on the best information we have, and often whichever one feels simply like the best way to go. It's so common in our culture, this idea of having two paths to choose from, that our most famous poem takes place in a wood where there are but two paths, and you choose one. And so we open up the second chapter of Proverbs. We hear about wisdom and knowledge, fear of the Lord, and we are presented by the writer of Proverbs with what? Paths. Which path shall we choose? One path looks pretty good. It's the path that I'm calling the path of understanding. Why am I choosing that? Because that's the word the writer of Proverbs keeps using over and over in these first 15 verses of the second chapter. 
If you missed it, let me read, it, read some for you again. He says things like, Make your ear attentive to wisdom and inclining your heart to understanding. Raise your voice for understanding. Search for treasures, then you will understand the fear of the Lord. Understanding. This path is a good path. It's an attractive path. This path leads us to a greater and deeper knowledge of God, to fear of the Lord, to wisdom in our lives. And by walking that path, we're also promised things. We're promised that we will be protected. We're promised that we will persevere. We're promised that we will know the difference between inequity and equity. We're promised that we will be watched over. We're promised that we will be one of the upright, the blameless, the righteous, if we simply choose this path. But there's another path. There's another path that the writer of Proverbs talks about. That, this path sounds like this. Those who forsake the paths of uprightness will walk in the ways of darkness. They will rejoice in doing evil and delight in the perverseness of evil. Those whose paths are crooked and who are devious in their ways. That path doesn't sound so great. Almost none of us would choose that path. Almost none of us, when given the two options between one path of righteousness, of equity, of perseverance, of protection, of blamelessness, and another of evil, deviousness, perverseness, crookedness, almost nobody would choose this path over here. And yet, when we look around the world, we can see that many of us commonly choose the path on our right. The path that leads us away from the knowledge and understanding and fear of God that doesn't hold any of the promises that we find in the first. Well, we can say, we can chalk that up to people who aren't like us, people who aren't as faithful as us, maybe people who aren't as Christian as us. But here's the problem with that argument. There's two billion plus Christians in the world. If all of us were choosing the path that was laid out at the beginning, the path of understanding, if all of us were choosing that path, the world would look radically different than it does right now. So how does this happen? How is it that over and over and over again in Scripture, we are presented with this way to live, and this way that leads us to greater knowledge and understanding, but not only that, greater love and compassion for the people around us, greater closeness to God, a greater sense of connectedness to the creation that's around us. How is it that that path is presented to us over and over and over again, and yet we consistently fail to walk it? How does that happen to us? Well, one answer is pretty easy and, and pretty boring, to be honest. One answer is we just have a very difficult time seeing any details. You're back in the line at Harps, right? You've chosen the line that you think is the best one for you, but how could you ever have known the person in front of you was writing a check? Checks are the bane of my existence, and I wish none of us had them when I'm in the Harps line. Or how could you know that the person in front of you would squabble over the, over the, the basket of grapes that they had purchased because there's a 50-cent price discrepancy. You could never have known these things. Sometimes, sometimes we get off path in life simply because we just can't tell the difference. It's just too difficult in the moment, moment of choice to tell the difference. But that's not the main reason. The main reason, the main reason we get thrown off our path in lives, even those of us who seek to walk the good one, is because of what I call the Rugned Odor problem. What, you ask, is the Rugned Odor problem? The Rugned Odor problem is the problem of the second baseman for the Texas Rangers. That's the problem. Don't worry, this is a short baseball anecdote. You don't have to check out. I'm only going to touch on this for a moment, but it's important. Barry's heard the sermon. You know it's like 20 seconds, right? It's not long. Rugnet Odor. I love Rugnet Odor. He's this fiery little guy. He came from Venezuela. He plays hard. He slides into second hard. Last year, he hit 270, 37 home runs. 
punched Jose Bautista, who's the most hated player in Major League Baseball, in the face. Everybody loved Rugnet Odor. I love Rugnet Odor. This season has not gone as well for him as I might have hoped. And there was an article that came out this past week that said that this season, Rugnet Odor was the worst everyday player in all of Major League Baseball. Can't possibly be true. He hits home runs. He plays hard. He punched Jose Bautista. He can't possibly be the worst player in all of Major League Baseball. And yet there's all this data and all this information that says, no, in fact, Rugnet Odor is the absolute worst player in all of Major League Baseball who played every day this season. So you see the problem, right? Sometimes, sometimes the ways in which we prefer to see the world don't line up with the observable facts about that reality. Because often what happens is this. We come to the world and we look at it and we decide how it should be or how we believe it is and then we make every other truth in the world conform itself to that view that we already hold. This is one of the most human things we do, and we do it in all aspects of our lives. From stuff as benign as sports to important as family relationships and all points in between, we start with a preconception and then we make everything else fit that preconception. And let me tell you this, we do the same thing with God. We do exactly the same thing with God. We take our preferred view of the world, the things that we believe are how they should be or as they are, we take our preferred view of the world that's incredibly subjective, built entirely in our heads around what we think things are and how we think things should be, and then we make our understanding of God conform to that worldview. If you don't believe me, I can, I can show it to you in one simple sentence that you see all over American Christianity. God wants you to be rich. You want to be rich, and therefore, you have decided that God wants you to be rich. It's a simple thing. It is everywhere. We take our desires, our preconceptions, our view of the world as we think it is, then we take God and we make God match those things. And then, lo and behold, without even knowing it, we have spent years walking the wrong path. This is how it happens. The solution is simple on paper, but very difficult in practice. When Jesus says to us that we should love God with our whole mind, with our whole mind, what he means is that we should conform our understanding of the world first to our understanding of the nature of God. It is God who shapes our reality first and foremost. And then we take our preconceptions, our biases, our existing beliefs, and we take those and we see how they fit with this understanding that we are continuing to grow into and receive of who God is. We do it backwards all the time. When we love God with our whole mind, we take those preconceptions that we have and we set them aside and we recognize that what we're going to do here is we are going to spend our whole lives on a journey understanding more and more and more about the source of all that is. What happens with these little quotes and phrases and things that we build from a sentence of scripture here and a little platitude there is we create a God who's incredibly small when in fact we worship a God who is vast. We believe, of course, that God created all that is. 
We believe that God knew us in our mother's wombs. We believe that God knows exactly what will happen into the future. We believe God sent Jesus Christ into the world so that we might have grace, something that we could never have possibly conceived of. We believe that there is nothing in our lives which can separate us from the love of God. We believe that the most important things we can do are to love God and to love our neighbor. These are incredibly challenging, large, complex ideas, way bigger than our brains can understand. And we, as pilgrims on this journey through the Christian life, do our best to simply make our picture of God ever larger and ever larger. And we do it by engaging Scripture, by listening to other people who've put a lot of thought into it, by listening to one another, by worshiping, by singing, by praying, by being open in prayer. In doing all of these things, we seek a greater understanding in just a small way, but every day of who God is, and we love God with our whole minds. Here's the most disconcerting aspect of the whole thing. It may be that what it means for us to love God with our minds is to accept the terribly unpleasant truth that we are wrong. Amen.